This week's click will fly by, I promise you, if you're on one of the electric bikes that we'll be wheeling out. And if you can't get a signal to watch the big match, help may be at hand, but it's probably not from where you might think. We'll also find out how wireless broadband may soon be helping the emergency services. And we have the app that helps you find the fake amongst all the photos in Webscape. Welcome to Click, I'm Spencer Kelly, and welcome to the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. A couple of years ago, this was the place to be if you wanted to be part of a major sporting event. Of course, there's another one, the World Cup final, coming up this weekend, unless you're watching one of our repeats, in which case, congratulations to Germany. Congratulations to Argentina for winning a really close fought battle on penalties, what was essentially a walkover. And many people, sports fans or not, do try and make plans to catch these big events live on TV if they can get the signal. And that was the problem Dan Simmons faced when his plans to catch the match were thrown up in the air. It's being touted as the best World Cup ever. So if you've not got a ticket for the final, it's time to make some plans. Obviously, one of the best places to see the match is probably here on Copacabana Beach. Or you could watch it at a bar or cafe. Or you could always watch it at home. But one place football fans definitely won't want to be when the big game is on is up in the air. Because here, well, there's plenty of good movies, but no match. Ladies and gentlemen, dear children, the big World Cup match from Brazil will shortly be shown live on Sport 24 channel on board this aircraft. Thank you. For the first time, this World Cup will be shown live to passengers mid-air by seven airlines signed up to show a live sports channel on long-haul flights. It's not just a business class offering either. Even the seats at the back get a good view and it seems to have caught on. So how do hundreds of people each get a live feed at the same time while traveling at 600 miles an hour? From its control room in Los Angeles, Panasonic Aviation tracks the 17 satellites that pretty much cover most flight paths around the globe. Each one can deliver up to 50 megabits per second, but that's to be shared between all the aircraft within that satellite's footprint. Although the Wi-Fi on board can get pretty speedy, it needs to be shared itself between the passengers. So a section of the bandwidth is set aside solely for the streaming of live sport. Next year, the company will start focusing the data signals specifically to just a few aircraft at a time, almost doubling data speeds. Specially made antennae on each aircraft need to work in some of the most challenging conditions any electronics could face. First being baked and then frozen to the sub-zero temperatures of 35,000 feet. Next, the equipment needs to be checked for precision and efficiency. A fraction of a degree out and the data rate falls dramatically, which could mean no football. You have multiple satellites that are required to provide this broadcast globally. But how do you transition from one satellite to another? So let's say from Europe to the Middle East, changing satellites, you have to be, it has to be timed exactly the same to be able to transition leave one satellite, reposition the antenna on the aircraft to the next satellite, and pick right back up in the broadcast where you left off. Quite a challenge. Like other big matches, a single video feed of the World Cup final will be sent to each aircraft, with the passengers then opting in to watch it, so you can't pause or rewind the match. Almost 50 airlines have signed up for the satellite data service on board, which could also be used to personalise our in-flight experience. 
In a year or so's time, expect airline apps to offer you the opportunity to choose what you want to watch on board before you're on the aircraft. You'll be able to pair your own device to your seat number so that you can pick from the menu what you'd like to eat. And it'll also tell you whether there's something interesting to look at outside the window. How airlines use and charge for the new services that in-flight data can now offer is still being worked out. But as live sport is offered free of charge on more planes, there'll be even fewer places where fans will have to miss a big match. Presuming, of course, they're still interested. Dan Simmons, a man who mysteriously disappears from the click office whenever the football's on. Now, this World Cup has certainly had its fair share of magic moments. Diving, goalkeeping substitutions, biting, and the crystal clear pictures being beamed back from Brazil have allowed us to see the action in greater detail than ever before. But through it all, some BBC engineers have been conducting trials which could make future matches look even better. For a number of years now, 4K, or ultra high definition as it's known, has been touted as the next big thing in television viewing. While fans the world over have been gripped by football fever, members of the BBC's R&D team in London have been testing the logistics of receiving a live 4K video stream from a number of World Cup games in Brazil. Three games in total, including the final, will be streamed in ultra-high definition, which offers four times the resolution of Blu-ray. The games have allowed the engineers involved to get closer than ever before to the action. Everyone talks about four times, four times the resolution that you get with 4K, and, and that's true. I mean, we've been able to sort of look at things in the crowd. We've been able to read people's watches on their hands in the crowd shots we've been seeing. Uh, that, that's really, I mean, the, the detail on these bigger screens where, you know, our, our 60, we've been using many 65-inch screens, and, and the, the difference between HD and, and 4K on those size screens has, has been quite noticeable. The operation has presented its fair share of logistical challenges, but hey, that's all part of the testing process. Of course, those behind the project are keen to point out that just because they're testing 4K doesn't mean it will be coming to our homes just yet. Obviously, people see the 4K televisions appearing in shops, but you have to think about the whole of the infrastructure, and production infrastructure needed in order to actually be able to uh, deliver that content. I think it will be like HD, where HD production took off much more before HD distribution. Uh, I'm sure we'll see a, single, a similar thing with 4K. Of course, by the time the next World Cup rolls around, who knows how we'll be watching TV or whether it will even exist. Although I do have a feeling we also said that during the last World Cup, so maybe don't hold your breath. Anyway, if you have any thoughts on that or anything else in this week's programme, please feel free to email us, click at bbc.co.uk. Now it's time for Tech News. Passengers around the world are currently being advised to ensure that electronic and electrical devices in their hand luggage are sufficiently charged to be switched on. Updated transport rules from several governments state that if a device doesn't switch on, you won't be allowed to bring it onto the aircraft. The new security checks have been introduced as a result of what American officials are calling a credible terrorist threat. Google Glass has been hacked so that it can, apparently, be controlled by its wearer's mind. User experience agency This Place has combined the specs with a MindWave mobile headset that measures brainwave signals. It allows users to take photos and upload them to social networks just by thinking about it. The aptly named MindReader software is open source and its developers believe it could give hope to those unable to communicate verbally. And although they might not be able to get a decent reception, 3D smartphones have boldly gone into space. Powered by Google's 3D mapping system Project Tango, the phones have been sent to the International Space Station to work with NASA's robotic spheres. It's hoped that the phones will act as the eyes and brains of these droids, allowing them to better navigate around the ISS. Yep, it's official. We live in a world of flying space robots equipped with phones. Any large event like the World Cup or the Olympics brings with it security concerns. There are a large number of people in one space and therefore it becomes a target for an attack. 
Now, there are new technologies around that help the police and emergency services deal with such events. And those developing the tech are now urging governments around the world to save dedicated broadband space just for that purpose. Jen Copestake was asked to breach security to test some new systems. Imagine someone is trying to place a bomb under a car. That's what I've been asked to do here to create a fictitious security alert. I'm testing new broadband technology for public safety and policing from Motorola Solutions. I may think I'm not being watched, but this is no ordinary car park. Yeah, dispatch to car one, uh, pushing video now. Over. This is car one. We are receiving live video over. This exercise is being run at Motorola Solutions Research Centre in the south of England. Large amounts of data, like maps and video collected on the security threat, me, are sent live to the patrol car that acts as a mobile response unit. All the security video taken throughout the day has been digitally analysed for blue, isolating me amongst the crowd by the colour of my dress. The result? A layered video of my movements. Next, facial recognition data can be fed directly to the police car. And it won't be long before I'm under arrest. Please, can you send us the picture of the suspect? Over. Wireless broadband technology brings to first responders some of the same capabilities that you and I as consumers rely upon. It brings the ability to virtually bring scenes to life from a remote location by transfer of video, by creating ways to communicate that just are not possible with just the spoken word. As I say, a picture's worth a thousand words, video's worth maybe a million words. The critical communications industry has been moving away from narrowband private mobile radio networks towards super-fast 4G broadband. This will allow vast amounts of data to be shared fast between first responders. In the future, paramedics working on a victim in an ambulance could send data back to medical specialists at base. Sensors on firefighters could monitor core body temperature, heart rate and blood pressure, and police officers could see a hazard in advance. What it allows in a public safety environment is for a CCTV camera of a, a specific area, maybe around the corner from where that officer is, um, to be streamed into to the officer's device so he, he can see clearly what is around the corner before he has to, has to put his head around the corner. But the pressure it could put on networks is already clear. When Hurricane Sandy hit the east coast of America in 2012, it only took a few hours for communications to jam, causing chaos for first responders. We're all using so much internet bandwidth in our daily lives that the spectrum is getting crowded. Unless bandwidth is reserved for the emergency services, public safety could be compromised. Many countries don't have dedicated bandwidth for first responders, and this will become an increasing problem worldwide. Spectrum problems are sort of ubiquitous in the world. I mean, it's a, it's a challenge, scarce resource, uh, you know, highly valued by uh, lots of services. Um, you know, I think just right now, Europe hasn't yet moved to allocate spectrum. But there are many issues to overcome. Privacy is one. With vast amounts of data flying around, how do you control who gets to see it? And prioritization. How do you avoid data overload? Anything is, is actually possible, the number of devices uh, and so on. But it's very important to note that when moving into a, a dangerous situation, an officer doesn't want data fed to him. At that point, he needs somebody telling him in his ear what it is he's about to face, uh, and he wants to know that somebody can talk back. So it picked me up, suspect Jen in the blue dress. Technologies like this are developing rapidly, especially in the US. Those backing these systems are pressing for dedicated broadband space for public safety. Otherwise, our crowded online lives may have an unintended impact on security and the work of the emergency services. Jen Copestake. Now that funny looking building there is the Olympic Velodrome. And with the Tour de France now in full swing, we thought it was high time we showed you this. It looks like an ordinary bike. It is a little bit heavier than an ordinary bike, and that's because it's a prototype of a new e-bike, an electric bike, which goes by the grand name of the Van Moof 10 Electrified.
If you've ever ridden an e-bike before, the first thing you'll notice about this one is that it doesn't have that unsightly battery pack sat just below the saddle. That's because the power cells here are built into the frame itself. It takes about three hours to charge fully and it can give you between 19 and 37 miles of range depending on terrain, traffic, weather and how you're cycling. Now this is a so-called pedelec. The electric motor only works when you pedal, so you do have to do some work. But as soon as you do, the power kicks in, helping you whiz up hills and whistle along the flats at a top speed of 18 miles an hour. Although you can cycle at quite a pace, I have to say you notice the electrical assistance most when you're pedalling slowly or up a hill because the motor kicks in and <laughs> it's actually difficult to cycle slowly. I mean, there's really almost no effort on my part at all to go at this speed. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's fast. That's why there's a button to switch down from 100% power to 50%. Although, to be honest, I still had trouble keeping it slow. And there's no way of actually switching it off from the control panel. There is a button for the LED lights built into the frame and even a remote control. The bike won't work without it, so it kind of acts like a theft deterring immobiliser. The dawn of the electric bike has certainly come and gone before, but as long as you have $3,000 to spare, this one could be here to stay. Now, cycling is becoming increasingly popular in town, and because of that, many cities now have a community bike scheme where you can hire special bikes from docking stations using your credit card and then return them to a different docking station later on where your card is charged. Now, it's usually the docking stations themselves that are the brains of the operation. But in Copenhagen, in Denmark, the community bikes have become smart. Lara Lewington took a ride. Copenhagen, one of the cycling capitals of the world. A place where there are as many bikes as there are inhabitants. In the 90s, this was the first capital city to install a cycle hire system. So it's little surprise that they've just upgraded to one at the cutting edge. When it comes to hiring a bike, it needs to offer something extra. Now, not only are these electric, but they also come complete with their own built-in, apparently vandal-proof tablet. And when it comes to reserving, booking and paying for one, you can do it all on this. You can select manual or whatever level of pedal power assistance you desire. You could go for longer distances, it's not sweating. Even if you have your own bike, a manual bike, and you want to go five kilometers, the fastest and easiest way to go is on an e-bike, and you get there without sweating. I'm not that confident on a bike. I was actually quite relieved that even when the electric element kicks in, it still feels comfortable and stable and safe. And the thing is, it's very easy to stop. The tablet offers GPS travel guides enhanced for cycling, making the bikes a liberating way for tourists to explore the city or for commuters to get to unfamiliar locations. There's an option to check train times, and you can even book a bike for someone else, pre-setting a meeting destination to make sure they head to the right place. At the same time, the GPS tracks who is going where, when, and that data is sent home every 10 seconds, meaning information on battery life, location and usage is constantly being collected. It is, of course, early days now, but the open platform means the potential for software development is huge. One idea they're trying out at the moment is location-based marketing, but there's also scope for improving the cycling experience for the whole city. We will get a lot of data from, from the bikes, we're already getting that, what is the average length of a trip, what is the speed people are cycling with, etc. Because then we can adjust the traffic signals to the speed of the bikes in the morning. If you have a headwind, then maybe they change in another rhythm than if you have the wind in the back. Is looking down at a tablet when on a bike safe though? Well, apparently there's been no problem yet. 
If you've finished your journey and there's no room in the docking station, then you can actually just leave the bike in a designated safe zone. You put the stand on, lock it, and you can leave. But right now, I'm in luck. 250 of the bikes have been up and running for a couple of months now, but the hope is it'll soon become thousands. Then maybe other cities will follow Copenhagen's example once again. Lara Lewington. And if you've been following the Tour de France, you'll know that one of the major talking points this year is the issue of people taking selfies too close to the cyclists. Of course, these days it is hard to work out which pictures are real and which ones are just people having fun with Photoshop. However, don't fear, Kate Russell may very well have the answer. Here comes Webscape. So what if you have a spectacular shot and you want to prove to others it hasn't been photoshopped or tampered with? Is it true? We'll help you prove it's genuine and unmodified. You probably won't have any need to prove your family holiday photos are real, but if you've captured a newsworthy moment or are taking evidential shots for an insurance claim or to sell an item on an online auction, then this service could really come into its own. You could also use it to prove something you captured to enter a photographic competition has not been tampered with. Just upload your shot and the website will host it together with prominent trust ratings. As cities sprawl out and 24-hour lifestyles take over, light pollution is a growing problem. As well as limiting our view of the heavens, unless you have blackout curtains, it has a negative effect on our well-being as sleep patterns are largely regulated by light. If this concerns you, a couple of interesting citizen science projects aim to track the extent of light pollution around the world. Android has the free Loss of the Night app, which allows you to monitor and report light levels in your area. She's always buzzing just like neon, neon. If you have an iPhone, there's a similar project called Dark Sky Meter. The app isn't free, but it's not expensive. The results can be viewed on the project's live map. While some cities are always in the light, some music remains in the dark. Spotify revealed statistics on its fifth birthday that said 80% of the 20 million or so songs in its database had been listened to at least once. Read between the lines though, and you can deduce that around 20% have never been played. That's four million unheard tunes that For Cotify wants to help you find. Spotify is famously not terribly musically discerning about what it allows to be uploaded to its library. So, there are some fairly shocking tracks in the fabled No Plays list. It is an interesting journey nonetheless, and I did come across the occasional gem. In a case of mistaken identity. You'll need to be logged into a Spotify account to play as you dig deeper and deeper into the musical rabbit hole of unloved tunes. Kate Russell, whose taste in music turns out to be just as bad as mine. Well, we've made it to the top of the ArcelorMittal orbit here at the Olympic Park, where you get not only great views of the Olympic Park, but also the City of London just over there. Now, for more from us, check out our website, bbc.co.uk slash click. And if you'd like a chat, we're on Twitter, Facebook, Google+, and on the email at click at bbc.co.uk. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time.